Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce Tom Hutchcroft. Um, Tom claims he's still a PhD student, although if you look at the astonishing list of his achievements so far, it's quite difficult to believe this. Um, so he's a student at University of British Columbia, and um, he's currently here at MSR as an intern with about a week to go. And during that time, he's added several more impressive proofs to this list. Um, so today he's going to tell us about circle packing. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about circle packing. And specifically, I want to talk about circle packing in relation to random triangulations of the plane. And this is joint work with uh, Omar Angel, uh, Asaf Nagnius, and Gaurav Ray. OK, so let me start by telling you what I mean by circle packing. Well, suppose we take a finite, simple planar graph. So simple just means that for any two vertices, there is at most one edge connecting them. And there are no loops that start at one vertex and return to the same vertex. Okay, so suppose we have such a graph. So planar obviously means we can draw it in the plane. But what's the best way to draw it in the plane? Well, uh, one quite convincing answer to that question is given by the circle packing theorem. So the circle packing theorem really gives us a canonical way to draw planar graphs. So the circle packing theorem says that every finite simple graph is the tangency graph of a circle packing. So what does this mean? A circle packing is a collection of disks in the plane with disjoint interior. So they cannot overlap, but they can touch or be tangent. And if I have such a circle packing, I can use it to draw a planar graph by just uh, drawing straight lines between the centers of circles if they, if they touch. Right? So clearly, I can get planar graphs from circle packings in this way. Uh, the hard and surprising fact is that every planar graph can be drawn in this way. And moreover, if the graph is a triangulation, which means that every face is a triangle, then in fact, this representation as a circle packing is unique as much as it possibly could be. So it's unique up to Mobius transformations, which, if you don't know, they're just the, the functions that send circles to circles and, and reflections. OK? So let me go over those uh, definitions again quickly. So a circle packing is just a set of circles in the plane with disjoint interiors. The tangency graph of the packing is the graph which has the circles as its vertices, and two circles are adjacent in the graph if they touch. And something I didn't already say is the carrier of the packing, which is the union of the circles, or really disks, uh, together with the regions that are bounded by uh, a path of circles representing a face in the graph. So this is the, the area of the plane that is taken up by the packing. And when we have an infinite triangulation, as we will do shortly, we call it a packing in the disk if its carrier is the unit disk, and in the plane if its carrier is the plane. OK, so uh, the, uh, the original circle packing theorem, which is due to, it has quite a complicated and interesting history. So it's accredited to Kerber, Andreev, and Thurston says that every finite planar graph has a circle packing. This was extended to infinite triangulations of the plane by He and Schramm in 95. Why the people who rediscovered the theorem get credit for it? I don't know. Well, first, and Andreev had not so much to do with the theorem. <laughs> Thurston rediscovered this theorem as a corollary to a theorem of Andreev and popularized it. So you popularized somebody else's theorem. Yep. 
<laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't realized until some time afterwards that it had already been proven 50 years earlier. When we encounter an alien civilization that also proved it, do they get priority? On the name? <laughs> I mean. Right. Well, well, we'll just add the names together in a long list. So, so he and Schramm proved an extension of the circle packing theorem to infinite triangulations. So if you take a triangulation of the plane, it can always be circle packed in the plane or in the disk, but not both, exactly one of the two. And so we call a triangulation circle packing parabolic if it gets packed in the plane and circle packing hyperbolic if it gets packed in the disk. And also, this packing, again, is unique up to, you know, it's unique as much as it could be. So the packing in the plane, if it's parabolic, is unique up to, you know, translation and scaling and things that obviously preserve the circle packing of the graph. And in the disk, it's unique up to Mobius transformations that fix the disk. Or in other words, the uh, isometries of the hyperbolic plane, if you think of the unit disk as being the hyperbolic plane. And together, this really gives you a discrete version of the uniformization theorem for Riemann surfaces. So here you can see this uh, picture is from Ken Stevenson's book. Uh, at the back, you can see the circle packing of the triangular lattice, which takes up the whole plane. Uh, here we have the circle packing of the five regular triangulation, which is finite, so it lives on a sphere. And on the right, we have the circle packing of the seven regular triangulation, which is in the disk. And you can see how the, the different types, are, these are obviously very different graphs, right? The, the circle packing type is telling us something about what the graph is like. And um, when we have this circle packing, we can also draw the graph, as I said before, in the Euclidean case, it makes sense. In the parabolic case, it makes sense to draw the graph with straight lines between the centers. For in the hyperbolic case, we can draw the graph with hyperbolic geodesics between the hyperbolic centers of the circles. And these, these drawings are actually determined by the graph, right? That's what rigidity tells us, that we take this graph, which, you know, it's just this combinatorial description of a triangulation, and we get all this geometry for free. Right, that it's really, it's a function of the graph. And uh, this, uh, this allows us to apply geometric techniques to study planar graphs. So I, I want to just quickly mention a few uh, classical or not so classical applications of this that I won't be able to get into further. Uh, so first, um, circle packing can be used to approximate conformal mapping. So this is a very uh, interesting thing, it was conjectured by Thurston and eventually proven by Rodin and Sullivan. Uh, something I really like uh, is that you can use circle packing to, to prove the planar separator theorem, which is a, a statement about the isoparametry of, of planar graphs. Uh, and there's a very nice proof using circle packing due to uh, Miller, Tang, and Thurston. And uh, a, a new thing that I unfortunately won't be able to talk about today, but in upcoming work with uh, Asaf Naknius, we use circle packing to prove that the free uniform spanning forest of every bounded degree planar graph is connected. So it's okay if you don't know what that means because I'm not going to talk about it any further. Okay. So suppose we have a bounded degree triangulation. Then the type of the packing and the geometry of the packing encapsulates a lot of probabilistic information about the triangulation. So I guess I forgot to mention, or my slides got mixed up or something, but the, uh, another part of the Heesham theorem is that when you have a bounded degree triangulation, this circle packing type, parabolic or hyperbolic, is equivalent to whether the simple random walk on the triangulation is recurrent or transient. So if the if the triangulation is recurrent, then the, uh, then the circle packing type is parabolic, it gets packed in the whole plane. If it's transient, it uh, gets packed in the disk. And it also tells us about things like harmonic functions on the graph. We can also do lots of 
things like resistance estimates using geometric techniques and sort of borrow some things from complex analysis. So this is where that came up. <laughs> right, so this is what I just told you. Another part of the Heyschram theorem is that the circle packing type in the bounded degree case is equivalent to recurrence of the simple random walk. Being the circle packing type being parabolic is equivalent to recurrence. And actually, when you have a CP hyperbolic triangulation, it's always transient, no conditions. However, in the, in the unbounded degree case, things can go wrong. So you can get a, a CP parabolic triangulation of unbounded degree that is transient. And you can construct one as follows. So you start with just the circle packing of the triangular lattice. And then you're going to add some circles in to create a drift. So if I put just one circle in each of these two gaps here, and then the next one along, I put two circles in the gaps, and then the next one I put four and so on. And I, I can create a drift to the right that makes the graph transient. So uh, probably everyone in this room knows this, but transient means that the, the random walk on the graph uh, escapes to infinity. It does not revisit every vertex infinitely often. And recurrent is the, is the opposite of that. OK. So there's more that you can say, though, in the bounded degree case. So Benjamini and Schramm looked at uh, circle packings of triangulations. And they proved that if you're in this uh, hyperbolic case, so you have your triangulation circle packed in the disk, and you run the random walk on it, and you look at where it is, then it converges to a point in the boundary. And they use this to, to deduce this kind of dichotomy that holds for all bounded degree triangulations. And in fact, you, know, you can extend it to all graphs. But you find that essentially, Transient planar graphs of bounded degree have to be very transient in various senses. So you get this, this dichotomy that breaks up parabolic, hyperbolic, recurrent, or transient. So either the random walk on the graph is recurrent, the graph is circle packing parabolic, and all the bounded harmonic functions on the graph are constant. Uh, so I should just remind you what a harmonic function on a graph is. So uh, a function on a graph, on the vertex set of a graph is harmonic if uh, for every vertex u, h of u is equal to the average of uh, h of v over the neighbors. So the value of the function at every vertex is the, is the average value of the function over the neighbors. Or equivalently, a function is harmonic if when I plug in a simple random walk into the function, I get a martingale. OK, so uh, you'll remember from complex analysis that there are no bounded, non-constant harmonic functions on the plane. And similarly, if you have a recurrent graph, it can never have bounded harmonic functions. However, it's not true that transient graphs admit non-constant bounded harmonic functions in general. So if you take any uh, Euclidean lattice z to the d, even so when d is bigger than 3, the random walk is transient. But for no d, are there bounded non-constant harmonic functions. However, for planar graphs, this dichotomy does hold. So whenever I have a bounded degree transient planar graph, then I get bounded non-constant harmonic functions. And why is that? Well, I can circle pack the if it's a triangulation, say, I can circle pack it in the disk, and my random walk converges to a point in the boundary. Moreover, Benjamin and Schramm also proved that the law of this limit point where the random walk converges to uh, has full support. So any interval in the boundary has a positive probability for the random walk to converge into it. And I can use this to define harmonic functions by I just take some function on the boundary, and I just take the harmonic function at v to be the expected value of the limit, the function applied to the limit of the random walk. Um, 
Uh, no, there's, if I take, I mean, it, it has to be like measurable. And, I mean, you, so whenever I have a function on the boundary, I can take, bounded yeah, bounded functions. Yeah. Let's say x infinity is the, uh, is the limit point, then I can always get a harmonic function this way. Right, so I just take the harmonic function at v to be the expectation of the function on the boundary applied to the limit point of the random walk started at v. So a natural question to ask is, well, are there any other bounded, it should say, harmonic functions on the graph? And in fact, the answer is no. So this was proven by... Uh, Angel, Balo, Gorovic, Girl, Gorovic, and Magnus. And so they proved that every bounded harmonic function on the graph can be represented as a function on the boundary in this way. And probabilistically, what this means is that if you know where the random walk converges to in the boundary, then you know all of the tail information about the random walk trajectory. So this, these are equivalent statements. And um, so the techniques here are things like resistance estimates, uh, Harnack inequalities, and the, the bounded degree assumption is really essential in, in, in all of this. So we wanted to rebuild this theory for random triangulations without the bounded degree assumption. And as I said, these, these techniques that existed really very heavily required the bounded degree, and they, there was no way to adapt them, so it required a... Some counter examples to these uh, oh, statements? Yes, there are. Uh, so, sorry, this is where I'm supposed to show you those. So, uh, so you can make a... Uh, it's the same thing. If I start with some circle packing, I can keep adding circles inside the gaps to create drifts. I can basically, if I, if I have no, uh, no conditions, I can make the random walk do absolutely anything I so desire. So I can make the random walk just go around in a spiral or something. So that it, it obviously has to go close to the boundary, but it doesn't have to converge to a particular point. Or another thing you can do is make two very strong drifts that go into the same point. Right? And then you get some tail information, namely, did I take this drift or this drift, which is not given to me by just knowing where I converge to in the boundary. So we ask the following questions. Firstly, is there an analog of the Hay-Schramm theorem to characterize the circle packing type of a random triangulation by some kind of probabilistic property. Secondly, can we, if, if I give you a random triangulation, can you tell me whether it's CP parabolic or hyperbolic? So if the, if the degrees are bounded, we know it's just recurrence or transients, but if it's unbounded, what do we do? Then in the hyperbolic case, can we recover this boundary theory? So does the, does the random walk converge to a point in the boundary? And does the limit have full support, i.e. every interval has a positive chance of the random walk converging into there, and no atoms, i.e. No, no single point has a positive probability for the walk to hit it in the point in the boundary. And lastly, is the unit circle a realization of the Poisson boundary, i.e. does every uh, bounded harmonic function on the graph arise as an extension of a function on the boundary? So here's an example of a random hyperbolic triangulation. This is the, the uh, Poisson, uh, Delaunay, Poisson, the dual of the Poisson uh, Voronoi complex in the hyperbolic plane. And so it looks pretty hyperbolic, right? <laughs> but uh, is it circle packing hyperbolic? Well, it, it's not so obvious, right? It has unbounded degrees, so. Of course it is, right? But we don't know that yet. <laughs> Okay, so 
before I talk about the answers to this, these questions, let me tell you a bit about what I mean by random triangulation. So, Benjamin E. Schramm convergence of graphs was introduced to study questions of the following form. What does a typical triangulation of the sphere with a large number of vertices look like microscopically near a typical point? So, in order to study this question, uh, Benjamin and Schramm introduced the following limiting operation. Take a sequence of finite graphs, Gn, and for each n, choose a root vertex, rho n, of Gn uniformly at random. We say that these sequence of graphs Gn, Benjamin and Schramm converge to a random rooted graph, G rho, if for each fixed radius r, the balls of radius r in the finite graphs around the roots converge in distribution to the balls of radius r around the root in the infinite graph. So let me show you some examples. If we take a big uh, torus or a big box, and uh, these all Benjamin Schram converge to the whole lattice, well, the torus is pretty obvious, the box is still pretty obvious. If I pick a uniform point, it's very likely to be near the center of the box. It's not so locally, it doesn't see the boundary. It just sees the whole lattice. Uh, the critical Erdős-Rényi random graph uh, converges to a Poisson galton watson tree. You know, people are pretty familiar with these things, I think. And the uh, the high ten binary tree converges to what's called the canopy tree. So you might think it converges to the binary tree, but it doesn't, because well, because if you choose a uniform point in this truncated binary tree, it's very likely to be a leaf or near a leaf. Right? So you get this thing that looks like an infinite binary tree viewed from a leaf. Okay. So if you think about this example a bit, you'll soon realize that there is no way to get the infinite binary tree as a limit of finite trees. For example, because the, uh, the average degree of a finite tree is always at most two, but the, the, uh, the degree of an uh, infinite binary tree is three. So you, you obviously, you can't possibly get it as a limit of finite trees. So by the infinite binary tree, you mean the three regular trees? The three regular trees, yes. And in fact, much more is true. So Benjaminian Schramm proved that every Benjaminian Schramm limit of finite they proved that every Benjamin E. Schramm limit of finite simple triangulations is CP parabolic almost surely. And they deduced that every Benjamin E. Schramm limit of finite planar graphs of bounded degree is recurrent almost surely. So not only can you not get the, the binary tree as a limit of, of finite trees, you can't get it as a limit of any sequence of finite planar graphs. Okay? And they, they uh, well, So you can also look at the, the, the uniform infinite planar triangulation. So if I, this, this question that they started with uh, was about you, take, you look at all triangulations of the sphere, you choose one uniformly at random, and you take one of these limits. And this limit was proven to exist by uh, Angel and Schramm in 2003. And this limit, the UIPT, it has a natural Markov property, which is that if, uh, if you explore the UIPT, so you, you have some region of this triangulation that you've revealed already, and you just reveal more and more of it bit by bit by peeling away at the boundary, then the law of the part that you haven't yet uncovered uh, depends only on the length of the boundary of the piece that you have revealed already, which is, it obviously has to depend on this. This is the minimum that it could depend on. So you might ask, well, is the UIPT the only triangulation with this property? And in fact, the answer is no. So well, the answer to this <laughs> question I phrased differently is yes. <laughs> so there is a one parameter family of random planar triangulations with this Markov property. So a half planar version of these was constructed by Angel and Ray. And uh, Nicola Curian constructed the full planar ones. So they have this one parameter family where with indexed by this parameter kappa, which goes from zero to 
a mysterious number 2 over 27. And when you plug in this endpoint value, 2 over 27, you get the UIPT. But all the others are somehow hyperbolic in flavor. And conjecturally, these other values of kappa, you can get them as local limits where instead of looking at uniform triangulations of the sphere, you look at a uniform triangulation of a high genus surface where the genus is growing linearly with the number of vertices. And so here's a, here's a picture of a circle packing of, a, of a, one of these Markovian triangulations with kappa that's quite close to, to this, uh, the critical value of 2 over 27. No. No. Yes. Right. The circles get, get smaller as you uh, as you go closer to them. Okay. Is that because sorry? <laughs> is that because it's harder to draw such a picture or No, I, this one is just looks more interesting. You you it has um I mean, the, the, the other ones are sparse, so you don't see so much. Is, is it possible to say what Kappa represents, or is that too complicated? It, 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 it's a... Uh, like, why is it not indexed from 0 to 1? <laughs> it, it, the way, the way uh, he constructs it is the kind of... It's a parameter that comes up in, this, in some distribution. It, it's, not, um, it's not a natural parameter like the curvature or something. It's just something weird. Um, okay, so every, all of the, everything that you obtain as a benjamin schramm limit of finite graphs always has the property of unimodularity. So what is unimodularity? We say that a random rooted graph, G rho, is unimodular if it satisfies the mass transport principle. So this says that if I take a function whose input is a graph with an ordered pair of distinguished vertices, and the output is a positive real number or a non-negative number. Right? So I think of this as a rule of how to send mass from some vertices in the graph to some other vertices. Right? So I'll say f g u v is the amount of mass that u sends to v in the graph g. So the mass transport principle says that for every such function f, the expected amount of mass sent by the root, which is the sum fg rho v summing over all v, is equal to the expected mass received by the root. So if you have a finite graph and you choose the root uniformly, this is kind of a, a funny way of writing an exchange of uh, the order of summation. But it's inherited by these benjamin schramm limits of finite graph. And it turns out to be an extremely powerful thing. I mean, really, if, if you want to prove something about uh, unimodular random graphs, the trick is almost always to find some mass transport that does all the work for you. Why is it called, can I, why is it called unimodular? You know where that terminology comes from? It comes from group theory. Uh, does it have something to do with the unimodular, unimodular and modular lattices or something? Uh, it comes from the modular function in group theory being what? one. <laughs> a group is unimodular when its modular function is equal to one. So the mass transfer principle was used a lot in transitive graphs for uh, this extension, and it doesn't hold in all transitive graphs, but it holds in all Cayley graphs, and generally it holds in unimodular transitive graphs, which means that the left har measure equals the right har measure on the automorphism. So, as Yuval mentioned, this, this property holds on every Cayley graph, it holds on finite graphs, and by extension, it holds on limits of finite graphs. Okay. So, this is our answer to the first two questions. Well, second question. So, suppose you have a unimodular random planar triangulation, and I need to put in this ergodicity condition here, but this just rules out uh, something dumb like, you know, you take the triangular lattice with probability a half and the, the seven regular 
a hyperbolic lattice with probability hop. Then what this theorem says is that I can determine the circle packing type just by calculating the expected degree at the root. So if the expected degree is 6, then the triangulation is almost surely para CP parabolic. And if the expected degree is bigger than 6, then the triangulation is almost surely CP hyperbolic. In fact, without this theorem, it's not, we, we don't know an elementary proof of the fact that the expected degree is always bigger than or equal to 6. Uh, there should be an infinite in the uh, <laughs> hypothesis of this theorem. We don't know an elementary proof that for a unimodular random triangulation, the ex an infinite one, the expected degree is always bigger than or equal to 6. So this is an open problem you might like to think about. But, and you can see that this, this implies uh, the benjamini schramm theorem that I mentioned earlier, because any limit of finite triangulations has to have expected degree at most 6. By Euler's formula, the, the average degree of a finite triangulation is less than 6. And so in the limit, the, the expected degree is at most 6. So how do we prove this? Well, the proof is actually extremely easy once you've seen it. So, uh, so let me remind you of the slide I showed you earlier, which says that the circle packing actually gives us a drawing of the triangulation and that the, the, the drawing is determined by the graph. And the important thing is here is here that this fact that the drawing is determined by the graph means that we can use the drawing to define mass transports. OK, so what do we do? Well, suppose I'm in the parabolic case. So I have my drawing. And for each uh, corner of, the, of a triangle, I send the angle at the corner to each of the three vertices of the triangle. Right? So remember that my the mass transport principle says that the mass into the root, the expected mass into the root, is equal to the expected mass out the root. Well, what's the mass out? Well, um, I just have all these angles. Sorry? From x. From x to, to each of x, y, z. So the mass out of x, well, I just have each corner around me, and I'm sending three copies of each of them. So the mass out is just 6 pi. What's the mass in? Well, each triangle that I'm adjacent to is sending me the sum of its internal angles, which is pi. How many of them are adjacent to me? Well, that's the degree. So I apply the mass transport principle, and I find that 6 pi is equal to pi times the expected degree. And well, cancel the pi's, and, and you're done. Okay, and you can see that in the hyperbolic case, exactly the same trick is going to work, right? So we just do the same transport. Now the mass out is still 6 pi, but now the sum of the internal angles of a hyperbolic triangle is strictly less than pi. So now I get a strict inequality here instead of the, inequal instead of the equality I had before, and I find that the expected degree is strictly larger than 6. And that's it. And this... this gives you a completely uh, trivial proof of the once difficult benjamini schramm theorem. OK? So we were also able to recover uh, the boundary theory of the triangulations. So our theorem states that if you have a, a random circle packing, a unimodular random circle packing uh, of unimodular random circle packing hyperbolic triangulation, and the second moment of the degree is finite, and you circle pack it in the disk, then each of the following hold almost surely. One, the random walk converges to a point in the boundary almost surely. Two, the law of the limit point has full support and no atoms. And three, it's a realization of the Poisson also adjoined to Furstenberg boundary. OK. And I should stress again that while the, while the results are exactly the same as the ones for the bounded degree case, the proofs are completely different. And so the, the key techniques here were we're going to see a lot of mass transports. And another technique is this notion, or 
it's not a technique so much as a concept, is what we call invariant non-amenability, which was a notion of non-amenability introduced by uh, Russ and David Aldous. Okay, so let me remind you what normal standard non-amenability is. So suppose we have uh, an infinite graph G. Then we define its Chiga constant to be the infimum of the size of the boundary of a finite set divided by its volume. So here, the boundary are the set of edges that have one point, endpoint in the set and one endpoint out the set, and the volume is the sum of the degrees in the set. So, and a graph is said to be amenable if the, if the Chiga constant is zero, and non-amenable if it's positive. Right, so for example, uh, this uh, lattice ZD is amenable because if I take a big box, right, then there are, uh, it has, uh, the volume is n to the d, but the size of the boundary is n to the d minus one. So as the box gets larger, uh, these, this ratio gets smaller and the infimum is zero. However, if you take, say, a three regular tree, then it's non-amenable. Any set in the, in the three regular tree has it, the size of its boundary is comparable to its volume. And probabilistically, you can think of non-amenability this way. Uh, so it's actually equivalent to the exponential decay of return probabilities for the simple random walk. So a, an infinite graph is non-amenable if and only if there exists a constant a less than 1, such that the probability if you start a random walk at time x, and you say, what's the probability that it's at x again at time n, then this is decaying like a to the n. So it's decaying exponentially. And so if we have, say, a hyperbolic lattice or something, these are non-amenable. Um, but are the unimodular CP hyperbolic triangulations non-amenable? Well, no. The, the condition is, is too strong to be satisfied by random triangulations. Um, because in the, in the triangulations we have, we'll have these large regions that look like the triangular lattice. And that's going to kill the non-amenability, because it's this very strong global condition that it, these, these rare bad sets are going to ruin. But we want to come up with a different notion of non-amenability that captures the same prop, uh, the same kind of properties, but applies in our setting. So this was introduced by uh, Russ and David others. So we start with some terminology. A percolation on a unimodular random graph, G rho, is a random subgraph of, the, of G, omega, such that this triplet, G rho omega, is unimodular. So what does that mean? It means I can define mass transports that depend both on the graph and on this random subgraph, and the mass transport principle continues to hold. And we write uh, k omega rho uh, for the components of the percolation that contains the, the root. And we say that a percolation is finite if all of its connected components are finite almost surely. So now here's the trick. Instead of taking this infimum over all sets, we look at finite percolations, and we take the infimum over the expected ratio of the size of the boundary of the component containing the origin to its volume. Where finite percolation means all components are finite. Yes, right. That's what this is. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's not recommended to take a common term and redefine it. Yeah. What? The word omega is finite. The <laughs> word finite is already taken. <laughs> oh. So I think to mean, uh, can you say what a percolation is? So it's a, it's a random subgraph such that this, the graph plus this extra, this zero one labeling of the edges is still unimodular. So I can define mass transports on the graph 
with this extra information, so they can depend on both things, and the mass transport principle still holds. So the expected mass into the root x equals the expected mass out the root. So it's not like you're doing mass transport on the subgraph. You're doing mass transport on the whole graph. On the whole graph. Using the extra information. Right, exactly. You can also do mass transport on the subgraph. But the definition is you do it on the whole graph and with the extra information. And we say that a, a, a unimodular random rooted graph is invariantly non-amenable if this guy is positive. So this is saying not only do, if it's conversely, if it's invariantly amenable, so this is zero, it's saying not only do sets of bad expansion exist, but I can actually tile the whole graph in, in, a, in an invariantly defined way so that the origin is in a set of bad expansion with high probability of the root. And you can sort of dually phrase this as the maximum density of a finite population. So this invariant Chiga constant is the expected degree of the graph minus the, the, uh, the densest you can make a finite population without it becoming infinite. So ZD is still invariantly amenable as well as being amenable. And in fact, for Cayley graphs, it turns out that this notion is equivalent to the classical one. However, here's an example of a random graph which is amenable, but nevertheless is invariantly non-amenable. Take a three regular tree and randomly stretch all the edges. So replace each edge with some path of an unbounded length, but with finite mean. And if it, you do it with finite mean, then you can play around with the root and move the root so that, the, um, so that it still is unimodular. And what you get is, is amenable, obviously, because you have these long things that just look like paths. Right? So, so they have the, their boundary is just two, and they have some big volume. So, so it's definitely amenable. However, it is invariantly non-amenable. And uh, critical garten watson tree, conditions five, is invariantly amenable. Um, and any, any recurrence uh, unimodular random graph is always invariantly amenable. So an extra ingredient of this classification is, in fact, not only does the expected degree determine whether the triangulation is circle packing, parabolic, or hyperbolic, it also determines whether it's invariantly amenable or not. So you get this really nice dichotomy that Either the expected degree is six, it's parabolic, everything's amenable, or conversely, all the, all the opposite things hold. So it's parabolic, the expected degree is bigger than six, and it's invariantly non-amenable. And this is, this is good news because... It's not the same. So it's the same? It is the same, yes. Um, so, well... We've defined this weird thing in very non-amenability, and we know that it holds for hyperbolic triangulations, but you know, what can we actually do with it? Well, it turns out you can do most of the same things that you can do with usual non-amenability. Uh, because there's this result of Benjamin, Elias, and Schramm that says that if we have a graph that's invariantly non-amenable, then we can take a random subgraph of it, which is really non-amenable. And this lets us carry through a lot of the same arguments that we would use in the really non-amenable setting. So, so just to point it, so there's an implication in one way, right, between invariantly amenable and Oh, non yes. Non-amenable is, is stronger than invariantly non-amenable. What you just said didn't make sense. You said you can take a, a subgraph that's legitimately non-amenable? Yes. Does, does, doesn't that make sense for your stretched tree? No. Uh, you can. Because that... You, you, yeah, it's it's not obvious, but this tree does have a random subgraph which is not. If you use really only these, if you use only the edges that are bounded by by a million. <laughs> you have to do something a bit cleverer than that, right? Because once you remove those, you end up with some paths that are formed out of the formerly yeah. short paths, and but you, you can do it. It's it's not obvious. It's their theorem. OK, so now I can tell you how we use all this machinery to prove convergence. OK, so let's suppose we were in this really non-amenable setting and that we had bounded degrees. <laughs> then 
there's some constant a less than 1, such that the probability uh, of, uh, for any, if I start the random walk at rho, and I look at the probability that I'm at some other vertex v at time n, it decays like a constant, depending on the maximum degree, times a to the n. But now, the total area of all the circles is at most pi. So that means that there are most 1 over a to the n over 2 circles of radius at least a to the n over 4. And this means that the, you know, I just take a union bound, and I find that the probability that the radius at the random walk at time n is bigger than a to the n over 4 is at most this exponentially decaying thing. Right? And this means that if I, uh, that the, uh, does this mean? <laughs> yeah, so it, mean, it means that the expected radius at time n is also decaying exponentially. And that means that we can, we can sum over all the radii, and the expectation of this sum is finite, right? And that means that the, the sum is almost surely finite. But this means that the, uh, the sequence of centers is a Cauchy sequence, right? For, for obvious reasons, right? Because if I just take the, uh, take the path between uh, xn and xm, it's bounded by the sum of the radii from xn to xm. So we deduce that the random walk converges almost surely. Now, OK, so I've been cheating by assuming we have this real non-amenability. But we can use this theorem that I showed you on the previous slide to, to push this through to the invariantly non-amenable setting. So we perform the same argument looking at the time the random walk spends in this really non-amenable graph. And there we get that the radii are decaying exponentially. And then you, know, you, you just have to control things on the time you spend outside and show that the radii are still decaying exponentially over the whole random walk. And in fact, more is true. So in fact, the, the, uh, the radii of the, um, of the, of the, uh, the radii of the circles that the random walk are at decay exponentially. And in fact, it's equal to the speed of the random walk as measured in the hyperbolic metric on the circle packing. And this, this is a nice thing because you know, so far we've been recovering a lot of things that we already knew about bounded degree triangulations, but this is something that's actually uh, new to the, to the random setup. Okay. So let me tell you a bit about why the exit measure. So this is the law of the limit point. Why does it not contain any atoms? Okay. So. When we have a unimodular random graph, we can always bias it in a certain way. So just change the measure a bit to get an equivalent measure, which is stationary. So that just means that if I take uh, g rho, which is this rooted graph, then it has the same distribution as g x1, where x1 is the first step at the random walk. OK. So I'm first going to claim that almost surely, there are either no atoms in the boundary, or there is just one big atom that has all the mass. All right, and this is a pretty straightforward argument. You just look at the atom of, of biggest weight and, and uh, get a contradiction if it's not one. So for each atom, let's define this function, uh, so hcv, to be the probable, sorry, this should be a v. The probability starting from v that the limit is equal to this point, right? So this gives us a harmonic function. And uh, Levy's 0, 1 law, which is just a special case of the Martingale convergence theorem, tells us that when I plug the random walk into this function, it just converges to the indicator that I actually converge to that point. So if I look at the probability from xn that I'm going to converge to this point, it just converges to the, to the indicator of whether I actually do converge to that point or not. So if we define mv to be 
the maximum of these h xiv over all the atoms, then this has a limit in 0, 1 as well, right? Because, uh, you know, well, it's obvious. But since the graph is stationary, see this thing m rho, actually, it doesn't depend on the circle packing, right? Because it's just saying, look at the biggest atom in the boundary, what's its weight? So if I apply some uh, Mobius transformation to the, uh, to the circle packing, this does not change. So this m rho is just a function of the rooted graph g rho, right? But we've just seen that it converges to something in 0, 1, right? But if you have a stationary sequence of random variables and they almost surely converge to either 0 or 1, then they all have to be 0 or 1, almost surely. Um, can you explain more slowly why the limit of MXN is 0 1? Because you have the max. So right. Um, yeah, so you can be a bit more careful with this. Um, so I can also look at a different harmonic function, which is the probability that I converge to an atom at all, or, or all atoms. Right. This also converges to, and this is just the sum of these, these guys, but this also converges to the indicator that I've converged to an atom. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if I converge to an atom, then that atom has weight tending to 1, and the total weight of all the atoms is also tending to 1. Right? That certainly means that this biggest atom is also converging to one, it's just that one. Conversely, if I don't converge to an atom, then the sum of all of them converges to zero, and that is certainly their maximum does. Okay. And so, yeah, so you have the stationary se sequence of random variables, it converges something in zero, one. It must just be zero, one almost surely to start with. Okay. So, so now we're in this setting where, so we want to get a contradiction from the assumption that atoms exist. So now we know that either there are no atoms, which is what we want, or there's just one big atom that the random walk always converges to. So what do you do? So let's assume that we're in this bad set. There's just this one big atom that you, the random walk always converges to. And in some sense, this says that our graph is not really hyperbolic. So what does this mean? Well, take the disk with the circle packing and apply a Mobius transformation, sending this one atom to infinity. Right? So I get a circle packing of the graph in the upper half plane now. And because this atom is unique, I can, I can make it stay infinity and stay at infinity. And this circle packing in the upper half plane is unique up to Mobius transformations that fix infinity, right? But these are just translations and scaling. All right. So one more thing. So you said before, so we're in the case when m of rho equals 1. Yes. So why is there a single atom in this case? Well, because the maximum weight of an atom is 1. And so the m is total... the sum is the maximum. Right. Okay. Yeah. We use the sum to bound down. That's right. Right. Sorry. OK? So now we have this packing in the upper half plane. And because this atom is fixed to be at infinity, it's, it's determined up to translations and scaling. So now we can draw the graph using straight lines between the centers. right? And this drawing is also determined up to translation and scaling. right? But now we can do exactly what we did before and deduce that the expected degree has to be equal to 6, right? Because we're basically in this Euclidean setting again. And, but we knew from our assumption that it's hyperbolic that the expected degree is bigger than 6, so we get a contradiction. And you know, this shows more generally that you cannot have any kind of distinguished point in the boundary. Here's a picture of a circle packing in the upper half. There's a different drawing, right? This is the, 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 the edges are not the same curves that you would get from the random transformation. Right. Right, exactly. They're not what? They're the same circles, but now we're drawing it the with straight curves. lines instead of the hyperbolic right. data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so I think I have time to show you this last thing, which is that the, the exit measure has full support, i.e. for every interval in the boundary, there's a positive probability that the random walk converges to it. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to define a mass transport on the graph in which every vertex sends a mass of at most one, but some vertices are going to receive infinite mass. Right? And this contradicts the mass transport principle. So maybe this, this is not quite immediate if you're not used to working with these things, but if some vertex receives infinite mass, then the root receives infinite mass with positive probability. So this is not too hard to show. And obviously, if the root receives infinite mass with positive probability, then the expected mass it receives is infinite, but everything sends a bounded amount of mass, so, so you would get a contradiction. And we're going to define the transport in terms of the, the hyperbolic geometry of the packing and of the support of the, uh, of the measure on the boundary. And so by rigidity, it's going to really be a function of the graph. OK. So suppose the, uh, the support is not the whole boundary. Then we can write the complement as a union of disjoint open intervals in the circle. So let's take the set and let's draw the hyperbolic geodesic between the endpoints of each such interval. Okay. And we'll write, so, so these intervals are indexed, uh, theta i phi a. Let's write a i to be the set of circles which are contained in the region between the boundary interval theta i phi a and the geodesic between the two points. OK. Now, suppose I have some circle here that's inside a i. So what do I do to define my mass transport? I look at the left-hand endpoint of the interval, right? So I'm in, inside this region. So, and I look, take the, the uh, hyperbolic geodesic from the hyperbolic center of this circle, and I follow it along until I hit a circle which also intersects this geodesic, right? And so I'll define a mass transport by just sending mass 1 to this circle, to this vertex corresponding to that circle. Okay? And, you know, it could be that I never encounter such a circle and then I just don't send any mass. That's fine. Now, let's look at this circle that's on the line V and look at the set of circles that send mass to V. Then how much mass do you send from you to this first One. Every, every vertex sends mass either 0 or 1 in total. OK? So we can, for each vertex V that intersects this line, we have this boundary interval, BV, which is just the interval between this geodesic that starts here and just grazes V, the circle corresponding to V, and this one that comes along and then just grazes something else. It's the first one to do that. Right? So I get one such interval for each vertex V. Maybe. Empty. Right. Sorry? VV may be empty. It may be empty. Yeah, that's right. This, this, this guy here has an empty interval, for example. However, Aside from some stuff here that might avoid everything, there is a interval of positive length uh, from some point inside here all the way up to phi i, such that uh, which is equal to the union of all the BVs, right? But there are only countably many circles, and they each have an interval associated to them and the union of all the intervals has positive length, that means there's some interval BV that has positive length. But now this vertex has to receive infinite mass because you know, it has this, this, uh, this open neighborhood of a boundary interval in which every circle in there sends mass to it. 
and the circles accumulate everywhere at the boundary. So, so this such a vertex phi receives infinite mass, and this contradicts the mass transport principle. Where did you use your assumption? That there were, that the support was not full. Well, that's how these uh, arcs were defined, right? Arcs. The arcs are the arcs over the complement of the support. So the BV is not in the support. Right, exactly. The, so this is not in the support, this is not in the... Right. You only send some things that are not... Uh, I don't know why. I mean, why? Yeah, I don't quite understand why they... The critical, the, the critical thing you said is that these circles accumulate everywhere on the boundary field, yeah. even though they're... Yeah. The hypothesis is that the support is not right. So again, where are you using that hypothesis? This game was played on the on the on the gap in the support. Right, right but where is the fact that this is a gap being used? Oh, because otherwise, there's yes. just none of this. There would be nothing. None of these arcs would exist. So it's just right. I, I define a set of arcs in a in a way that's a function of the graph. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it doesn't really use the fact that it's the support. Right. There's nothing. Really about the random walk, it's just... Uh, it's just you cannot <laughs> define a set of arcs like this. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's similar to in the, with the atom, right? We didn't... We just said there's no distinguished point, so... Oh, you're saying there's no distinguished open I see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, that's... Sorry, that's part of the... Uh, the Heysham theorem. It, it, it comes in the... It's part of the definition of what a circle pack in the disk is. We, we were waiting for the hypothesis to surface, but it never did. <laughs> <laughs> it, or just very... It just slipped very, in here. With, very with, with, with just this surface. first sentence. But you should sort of... I mean, in, in, you should phrase it well like this, right? There's no distinguishing. Sure, I or, mean... Because um, that's a stronger step. Right, although I think it's implied by... The thing about you, you could also prove that stronger statement just knowing the statement about random walk and not. Yeah, but, but, just, <laughs> but just for the reader of your proof to yes. understand what's going on. And to be able to use it somewhere else. Right. Sure. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone Any more questions? Um, so I'll just take this opportunity to, to mention a question. Uh, in a paper with Odette and Yitai, we used an argument very similar to that one at the end to prove that every invariant force in the hyperbolic plane has the property that all the, all the ends converge to a boundary and the support is full. But uh, it's open in higher dimensions, uh -huh. hyperbolic space in dimensions three or more. Right. Yeah. So if you have an invariant forest inside yeah. the dimension. Yeah.